the helps. And God, we do thank you for the gift of the day. We thank you for both the rays of sunlight and the drops of rain to remind us that your worth is not determined simply by the weather. So we thank you now for a space to come to and share in conversation as it relates to your way, your word, your will, and who you are. So give us questions and responses. Give us the gift of silence in certain spaces. Give us illumination for our minds. Give us liberation for our bodies and give us salvation for our souls. May we be better because we gathered in this space on this day and for this cause. In the name of a loving and living God, we pray, amen. So, this is part 12 of the Son of God, Black Jesus, Right Lives, Race in the Black Church. And I wanted to start it, I wanted to start tonight's conversation off with a question to get some perspective. So if I was to ask you, uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that mean for you? What would you say? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a follower of of Jesus, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Means that you can't do what you want to. Do. Means you can't do what you want to. All right. I feel like the thing you say. First of all, you got to study. Okay. And then we have to kind of try to the best you can to mold your life along his path, you know, doing things to help people, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to share his his teachings with others, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. You know, that's what I feel like. Okay, so it, it means something about the life uh, that Jesus lived and trying to emulate that life, right? right? It also means some level of, I think the word you're bringing up, Sister Carter, has something to do with discipline. You know, the root word in disciple is discipline. And it means to, in Sister Carter's terms, you can't do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. You have to discipline yourself. Go ahead, you want to say something? You can't say what you want to say. A lot of times you have things that you need to be saved. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, and so you are afraid if you say it will take you. They will mean it. You say it one way, but they will put it in the wrong way. Hmm. So take your Bible to Romans chapter 10. And the reason I ask that question is because I know that as it relates to tr Christianity, traditionally, there are certain things that we have been taught to assume that means. Uh, go ahead. So Romans chapter 10 is where we're about to wrestle for a second. Sister Carter, say a little bit more about being Christian means to have discipline. Well, 
Can't say what you want to say. Can't do what you want to do. Even if you think it's right. Right. Because the person that you're slamming to may not look at it the way you look at it and may interpret it the wrong way. So not only is it about discipline, it's also about a certain type of humility, right? You can't be kind of hard to be arrogant and be a Christian at the same Sometimes time. Sometimes you want to say something uh-huh. back to the person, or you can be corrected them, yeah. and they will take it the wrong way. It's just, especially if that person is not, I don't know, because sometimes when you say things or uh, do things, they'll tell you, they'll go and tell somebody else, she thinks she more religious or mm-hmm. she more righteous or mm-hmm. she more you know, uh, uh, living a Christian life. Yeah, uh, I don't want to put it a hard life, but it's a very stressful. No, no, yeah, it, t- it takes effort. It takes it takes requirement. It's funny because you know most of us, uh, when we were taken into Christianity formally, that's not what people told us, right? It, I mean, that's not what they said. Usually, when you take it into Christianity formally, what is given to us is not this is the type of life you're supposed to be living, a life like Jesus lived. What it means to be Christian is to live a disciplined life. Now. We may hear some of the stuff as, as it relates to what Sister Carter said at first. This is what you don't do, right? right. We hear that. You get that in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? But this concept of the way Jesus lived is the way we ought to live. We need to try to help people, all this other stuff. I think that's understood, and it's usually a generic approach to what it means to be a good person in general, but it's not necessarily referred to all the time. Hey, Emma. Uh, as, as as what it means to be specifically Christian. So here is what is usually read to us uh, when when we are formally adopted into the Christian faith. Most of the time, right? This is the, the technicality. So, so you come to a revival, right? It, it, or at some point during a worship service, a reference is made to Romans chapter ten. That's what we read for a second. Romans chapter ten. I asked the question. Right off him, I was like, what does it mean to be a Christian or a disciple of Christ or a follower of Christ? And so one person, Brother John, say, uh, it has something to do with living a life like Jesus lived, this sort of thing. And uh, Sister Carr says, the first has something to do with uh, discipline. You can't say what you want to say, can't do what you want to do, right? So this is kind of the stuff that we're bringing up. And I'm trying to put that in those comments in conversation with the broader assumption about what we are taught or introduced to when we formally become members of the Christian faith. Because when somebody says something to you about being a Christian formally, we're usually referencing Romans chapter 10. And so Romans chapter 10 starts off, this is Paul talking to the church at Rome. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved. Now notice, either one of y'all said anything about this word, salvation. To be Christian for both of you, for both of the people who commented, and, and, and I would argue, hopefully for all of us, it's something more than just receiving salvation. But this is Romans 10. He says something about saved, that you might be saved. Not that you might live a life like Christ, right? Not that you would live with discipline, that you might be saved. Verse 2, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. He's talking about religious people. People who say, remember you said a second ago about, this is Romans chapter 2. You with us? Okay, so, so yeah, we're talking about um, uh, people who are who are religious. Verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Verse 4, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Notice, he's talking about belief. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about belief. He didn't say anything about, he didn't say Christ is the end of the law so that there may be people who live with discipline or people who live like God. That's not what he is saying. He is saying Christ is the end of the law. Now there is therefore no more condemnation for them that are in Jesus, or them that believe in Jesus, right? Verse 5, he starts talking about Moses, describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. So he talks about law stuff. 
verse 11, he's still talking about scripture. Scripture says, whoever trusts in him will never be put to shame, all of this stuff. And then you have the uh, commonly referred to statements, especially around time of revival and the rest in the life. And that's verse 10. For it is with your, no, let me go up. Uh, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is what people usually say when people come to Christ. They don't say anything, most, most people, and I'll get them. By and large, people don't say anything about discipline and, and lifestyle. They say something about confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart and you are saved. What do you mean be saved? I'm saved from my sin. I'm saved from eternal damnation. How are you saved? The, how, how are you saved? The blood of Jesus covers your sins, right? This is salvation language. This is the common language that we get when we're talking about what it means to be Christian. So what it means to be Christian for most of us is, is not uh, normally or is not instructively taught to us as it relates to how we live it's more so simply what we say and what we believe if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved for it is with the heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved he talking about heart he talking about mouth. He say nothing about hand, feet. But really, that's that's why people really a lot of people, you know, like you were saying earlier, they come to Christ just to be saved. Yeah. So they, they ain't thinking nothing about how they need to change their life. Huh. Just so I'm saved just because I said I believe in Christ, and you yeah. know, yeah. and that's how you really get in first get into it. Yeah. Is that? Is, is, is what we call, you know, several weeks ago, the insurance policy. Right. You know, I don't know if there's a hell or not, but just in case there right. is, I don't want to go. Right. So let me sign on to this Christian thing. Right. Or as one person said, uh, I, I'd rather believe that there is a hell and find out that it ain't than to believe that there ain't a hell and find out that it is. Right? right? Or... or Really what they said is, I'd rather live like there is a hell and then find out that it's not than to live like there isn't a hell and find out that it is, right? So again, it still has something to do with this concept of salvation, being saved because of our sin, being saved from our sins, giving us access to a life, a eternal life that is not a eternal life of damnation. But it's not living with discipline, watching what you say not being too arrogant. It's not lit, and, and, and this is where I'm really trying to get to because I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up the, the theories, the, the mentalities as they relate to Jesus being son of God and Jesus being son of man. So the, the theories, the ideas behind these things are customarily taught to us as it relates to who Jesus is in relationship to our salvation. Come on, man. Um, I think uh, a lot of us we start out with the hope and belief mm -hmm. of uh, the salvation. And as you go along this walk, you progress. And then that's where the discipline can come in. Mm -hmm. Because it takes discipline. To stay on that path. You used to doing what you want, going where you want to go, mm -hmm. saying what you want to say, acting the way you want. And then when you come to a realization that you're doing something wrong, or you're creating uh, an atmosphere about yourself that you're forcing other people away from, so to speak. And you're looking for that connection. And then that's when you try to say, well, okay, I tried this. Let me try this. And uh, we don't have that many teachers. 
that's going to break it all down and make it seem so real for us that one person can put it all together. Uh, you got a lot of us, we, we go up into these different factions, but what is it about this life that you want to try to hop? Mama said the stove oh, is hot, uh -huh. but instead of trusting her, believing, one day you get that nerve to try it. Mm -hmm. And then there you go. Now you try this inside of where maybe mama's right mm -hmm. or maybe mama is wrong. And you keep going down that path and then you realize your life is empty. Mm -hmm. Something's missing. And fortunately for me, I was able to find something else to try to hold on to. Uh, salvation, uh, you read in the Bible, uh, you, you, you talk about eternal life, and you, you want to believe there's something else. Mm -hmm. You want to believe there's that other side. And not just for the day, but for eternity. And uh, you're just looking for, uh, well, like you say, that insurance policy. Well, if there's a hell, when well, you're reading about the damnation, you, you're you reading in Revelation about the monsters mm -hmm. and all of that, and something inside telling you this is true, this is real. So how do you come back? And, and I, th I think you're bringing up some very um, critical points too. Uh, how we read scripture impacts the way we see and understand God and what we think the role and the function of our faith is. So, you know, you said something within is telling you that this stuff is true. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, true to what? I mean, was there, was there really a, a you know, did, did John really see in, in the book of Revelations, did John really see a beast with all of these horns or is he using metaphorical language to describe a political reality that he cannot speak about directly because if he speaks about it directly in the letter that he writes they are gonna take the letter and burn it and it'll never get to his people right and I'm not saying that one is right or wrong I'm, I'm saying that the way that we read the scripture impacts the way we think about God the way we think about faith and vice versa the way we think about faith and the way we think about God impacts the way we read scripture so you know putting this stuff into conversation becomes more and more important for us to get not just a belief but a understanding that leads to a particular type of lifestyle so when you were talking about the metaphor about um, um, mama told you or the analogy mama told you that the stove is hot right uh, on the one hand you have legitimately hot stoves that if the person is trusting their parent and listening human nature if you will may require us to still get close to it but at least you ain't got to go all the way there and burn it so right you get there you see it's warm well mama knew what she was talking about it's sure right right and then that, that's one way to think about faith that there are certain rules and disciplines that that, that have, have have been uh affirmed over time tried and tested and true and so jesus becomes a model of what is hot and what is cold, this sort of stuff. And then you try certain stuff, then you're like, well, yeah, okay, well, now I'm close enough to know that it was hot for real or at least it's warm. I don't got to burn myself. And then, you know, I step away from that. But at the same time, with that reality, there's an alternative reality, too, that people have told us about stoves that were hot that ain't hot. And matter of fact, it may be food in that stove that we need. But we've been trying to figure out how to live without getting close to the stove because the stove is hot. And that's whether or not they felt like they were telling us about this stove or how hot the stove was to try to protect us from stuff. Yeah. Or if there are people who want food that's in the oven for themselves and say, if I can tell them that the stove is hot, nobody's going to have the courage or the conviction to go close enough to realize, wait a minute, even if it is hot, the show ain't as hot as they were saying it was, and it's something in that I need. So these are the two, and I'm saying all this to say, you know, I'm trying to ride this metaphor out 
to talk about the ways in which we approach the life of Jesus or what it means to be Christian. So sometimes it's like what it means to be Christian is simply to believe that the stove is hot, that you don't want to go there, and then it's, it, if, if you go, you know, you, you're going to get burned. And then, you know, it, it's the, that's the insurance policy belief part. That's the salvation part, right? We're being saved from something. But at the same time, I think we need to engage the faith and the scriptures and the portrayal of Jesus and how that applies to our life in such a way to recognize there isn't just one stove. There's several stoves. Some of the stoves got food in them. And some of the stoves we need in order to, to survive. So I'm, I'm saying all that to say, again, the primary references or titles that are given to Jesus scripturally are the Son of Man and the Son of God. And what I've been trying to explain and interrogate are the identities that are embedded within these two titles. What does it mean or who is Jesus when, when scripture referred to him as son of God? Who is Jesus being described as when the, when the scriptures refer to him as son of man? So for me, this is what I've been trying to highlight. The son of God, which is the most common reference in the 21st century to Jesus, is probably more about the hot stove. Don't get hot. Son of God tilts heavily towards the divinity and saving or salvific persona and personality of Jesus. That's one. That's a reality for us, right? So, so be clear. I'm not saying that, that there's no such thing as a hot stove. Okay? But do know, stoves are usually hot because what? Well, but why do you turn them on? You, because there's something in them. Okay, so on the one hand, you have stoves that are hot. They just too hot. You need to be saved from them. Ain't nothing in them. They warm, you warm them up, you ain't even put the food in yet. That's the reality. And, and, and so you have the Son of God persona and personality to give us the discipline to stay away from hot stoves. But you also have a Son of Man personality that I think tilts towards Jesus's humanity and a social political persona of Jesus which means the stove may not be hot even though people have told us the stove is hot because some people don't want us to get access to the food inside the stove I'm saying both things are part and parcel of our spirituality and of our faith. I'm saying that it means something to us traditionally and eternally to say, I trust, I believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that sort of stuff, right? That, that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. That means something to us on one level. It also means something to us to, to, to develop and progress to the level of discipline and, and lifestyle adjustments to A, know the type of life Jesus lives, B, why Jesus lives the type of life Jesus lives, and C, how we're going to try to emulate that type of lifestyle too. So let me say this again, then we'll engage in some more conversation. So you got the saving, salvific persona, then you got the social political persona, you got the Son of God, you got the Son of Man. And it is my belief that a sincere belief with the association of Jesus as one or the other as opposed to as opposed to one more so than the other has served to our religious detriment i'm going to explain what i'm saying right now to tilt to jesus's divinity the son of god persona associates jesus with what i believe to be a a historical whiteness this is the white jesus the white jesus that i've been talking about and it pivots our personal relationship with god on piety how to be righteous how to make sure you do the right thing and salvation and it causes us to have a pacifist spirituality, one that's socially and politically disengaged. What goes on in your society, in your community, in your neighborhood, what goes on politically, don't really matter as it relates to your eternal salvation. God don't really care if you go to the polls or not and vote. God don't really care who you vote, vote for. And I'm not saying that God does, but I'm saying that the white Jesus is concerned so much with our salvation and our eternal life that we don't even see any connection to that type of Jesus and the other type of Jesus, the son of man that tilts towards Jesus' humanity and associates Jesus with what I call a historical blackness 
and pivots our communal, not just our private or personal relationship with God, but our communal relationship with God on, on our prophetic involvement. How do we, to use John's terms, live out our faith on an everyday grassroots living room level? And how do we develop the social consciousness, being mindful of what's going on in the world and what God thinks about it, to compel us to live a life like Jesus lived? So I'm trying to highlight both of them because I think, for the most part, most of us have been introduced to one, but not necessarily introduced to the other. We get a lot with the Son of God, a lot with the salvation, a lot with the sacrificial atonement. Not so much with Jesus as his lifestyle, why he lived like he lived, why he prayed like he prayed, why he moved like he moved, why he did what he did that ended up causing him to be crucified and then being resurrected. So tell me y'all feedback, y'all questions, and then we'll look at some more scriptures and stuff. But I, I'm really trying to, uh, I'm really trying to have a conversation. Jesus, Son of God, which I think is a white Jesus per se, and then Jesus, Son of Man, which I think is a black Jesus. Now, understand historically, Jesus is a black man, right? We know this, but at some point, he starts being portrayed as a white man, right? The, the, the image, the picture of Jesus, right? Uh, right now, uh, we don't have anything that's really speaking to Jesus uh, past that age of 13. So it, it, it's like all of that's lost. You know, once, uh, before I ask you about Book of Thomas mm -hmm. and uh, looking at that uh, History Channel show, it talked about uh, in the Book of Thomas how Jesus uh, was talked about from 13 to 30. Mm -hmm. And you uh, fill us in on beliefs of how he thought, how he prayed, mm -hmm. how he talked, how he walked. And in this, we don't get nothing other than what somebody wanted us to have. So we go back to Constantine. Mm -hmm. And when you go back there, I think you got to get into Constantine's mind somewhat to try to figure out what changed him why he thought different from his predecessors because it was actually the Romans that actually crucified Jesus. Constantine Rome, why he thought different and why he wanted to put all this together. And I think it's simply because of the fact that he had gotten the same information about Jesus being risen from the dead. Uh -huh. And I guess being the type of scholar, he's figuring something's got to be with this. So let me let my people get in on it. And it's like you get the story of the Romans, but you don't get nothing else about why afterwards Christianity pretty much comes about yeah so let me let me put some stuff into some historical perspective but some of those people may not be necessarily familiar with what you're talking about so and, and we rehearse this sometimes in in midweek but I don't think this part of the story ever gets old so you hear me talking about Jesus's life becomes the reason why Jesus gets crucified so Jesus is violating uh, Roman laws one of the Roman laws that he is violating is, is, is called, he's guilty of sedition, S-E-D-I-T-I-O-N, sedition. Sedition means that he's inciting a riot. So inciting a riot because Jesus is said to be inspiring all of these young peasants to revolt against the Roman government. So Jesus, as we said before, this young 33-year-old black man who is growing up in a country and a culture controlled by rich white people. Romans are 
Italian, Italians are European, Europeans are white, they're rich, they run everything in the, in the country at the time. They sentence Jesus to death. The purpose of them killing him was supposed to say, you do not go against the Roman government. Whatever you do, don't do what Jesus did, because if you do what Jesus did, you're going to end up just like Jesus ended up. If you live like Jesus lived, then here is your result, right? So notice Matthew even says, when they hang him on the cross, they put a sign over the top of his head that says, here lies Jesus, king of the Jews. So all you little Jews who think y'all going to be like this brother right here, if y'all do what he did, this is what's going to happen to you, right? So I, I'm coming, I'm coming to, a, to a point for a second. Let, give me a little latitude right quick. So they kill him. And then, as Emmett has suggested, rumors are suggesting he's been resurrected, right? Not to mention, y'all heard me preach this a couple of uh, Easter's ago. I mean, the Roman government goes through all kind of stuff to make sure nobody steals the body of Jesus. I heard that they're going to be stealing his body. So they sign it, they seal it, you know, they, they put him in a borrowed tomb. They put a big old boulder in front of it. They put all of this sort of around it to, to, you know, it's the same way you would sort of some stuff now. So that it ain't you know, loose. And they put a symbol, the, the, the Roman signet, sit on, and he still, they, they still, you know, he still ends up getting out of that some kind of way, right? Which, which we're going to call, you know, for those of us who subscribe to the uh, theory of resurrection, we're going to call it the resurrection theory, right? So, it, so it's a resurrection. He's resurrected. And so now, the word is spreading. Hey, you know they talking about what Jesus did, what you can't do, and you end up like Jesus? God raised him from the dead. So maybe it is all right to live that lifestyle, even if it means pissing the Roman government off and getting killed for it. Because ultimately God decides, you know, God has the last word. That's the whole thing about resurrection, right? No earthly power, no Roman government, no American government, no Babylonian government, Assyrian government, Persian government, Greek government, Egyptian government. None of them have the last word. God has the last word. So the Romans are still in power, but Jesus' people are starting to increase more people are inspired more people are inspired the same thing that they did to try to uh discourage people from becoming christian or living like jesus did has has worked in reverse so hundreds of years go by these things are building wars taking place between you know christian factions and, and, and uh, non-christian factions right roman factions it's beef between rome and and well, the romans and the christians and then at some point Constantine comes to power. This is the Roman emperor. Constantine comes to power. Now, one theory is he has a dream. And in the dream, uh, he sees a sign. It's the Greek letter chi, which would be the X, and a, a, a rho, uh, another Greek symbol. And, and, you know, these are the first letters of Christ in, in, um, in Greek language, right? So, in, in other words, he has a dream that says, you know, Christ, and he says that the, that the voice in the dream says, by this sign you will conquer. So he is basically, because of that dream, converted to Christianity. So here's the big list, right? So, so here's the big, wait a minute. Jesus lived a life against the Roman government and not a head of the Roman government saying he Christian. What are you going to do? Right, so you can see. Hopefully, you can see the obvious conflict in that. What you gonna do? How you gonna tell your people that the people who they've been warned against, you on the same side of them now? One of the things you can do is find a way to put an image together that they can relate to and identify with that would compel them to subscribe to the religious, especially the spiritual concepts but not the political and social concepts. So what happens is people in Rome start to reproduce images of what Christians look like. And guess what they make them look like? They make them look like Romans. And so there are councils and all this other stuff that edit certain texts and you know adjust certain texts and redact certain texts. Ah, you know, Jesus. Ah. You know, and try to, and this is what you keep hearing me reference as it relates to the whitewashing of Jesus. Or now, what you have is not just the historical Jesus who was warring against the Roman political empire. You got a Jesus who was presented as, 
hanging on a cross in submission to God's uh, uh, will for the world that the world would be saved through this black man's death and, and that's the big to do now it ain't so much how he lived it's get access to him for your own soul salvation so that's some of the stuff that you hear uh, brother Emmett talking about as it relates to Constantine and how this and how that and I hope I also responded to some of your inquiries about how we get you know, yeah, some of the stuff uh, I'm just going to add that also he was warring with was that the Sanhedrin? Did the Sanhedrin, yeah. yeah. And uh, that today is still uh, that that struggle is still going on. And I think when I first came, one of the things that I wanted, I think I asked, was why? What did God see? in this particular people mm -hmm. that he made them his chosen people because they actually sent Jesus to death because yeah. Pontius Pilate come to him. You got a choice. You can take Jesus okay. or you can take okay. Barabbas. Right. Who do you want? Is it give us Barabbas? Right. And so we send Jesus off to die. But even with all of that, the, uh, the puzzle is so big and so great and so a lot of people say, well, uh, he killed his, he kidnapped his three uh, Israeli teens, <laughs> they killed him. Now they done went back and kidnapped a Palestinian team and killed him. Uh, what's the sense in all of this? It goes all the way back to Yeah, it does. It, it, it does. Yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah. it is a, a argument over um, favoritism. You know, yeah. poor guy's favorites, yeah. right? But again, I think too, Brother Emmett, it, it, it goes to how we read these scriptures. Because, because... Most of us get lost. Yeah. Most of us get lost. I, I don't want to say most of us. I get lost with trying to break it down. And for the most part, the, 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 the old words, it gives the uh, pause, and then I get frustrated. When I can't follow it, then I stop. But if I can get my hands on like a new, a new version of the Bible, where I'm kind of used to the reading, and I can get some of the the they, the does, and all of that. Yeah, get out of that King James yeah. English to something that's a little bit more. Yeah. And then you kind of see how it applies. And for me, it just goes back to what you were saying earlier. Trust is monumental. The faith, the belief, that's, that's, that, that's really the tie that binds because uh, somebody can ask you, well, why do you believe? And you may not have an answer, but then if you say, well, I know that I know that I know. Uh -huh. And that's good enough for you. And that's something that you can hold on to and kind of feel. And uh, I, I think that's what, what it helps me. I may not be able to give you yeah. all of this other, yeah. but when I can say I know that I know. Right. Well, well, you know, and that too is a uh, cliche yeah. that they have passed down to yeah. us to try to give us, listen, eternal security that we feel good, about, right? And when I, when I believe that it's okay not to know that you know that you know. And to be in the human process of trying to figure out what this faith thing means. But to stand on something as simple as this. I am inspired. I mean, these are the early Christians, right? What we talking about? I am inspired by the way Jesus of Nazareth lived his life. And I want to live my life like him. Right? And you, you can apply that to everything yeah. that's going on right now. Right. And, and, and so with that, I try to present us with... First, a contextual reality of scripture and faith 
and religion to empower us to know people make choices on how they identify, how they choose to live. You know, people make choices, right? And, and all of us, we can make these choices, which why you hear me saying, if somebody tilts towards the Son of God way more than the Son of Man, that's the, they have liberty to do that. That doesn't make them any more or less Christian to me. Right? That, I mean, that, that's what they subscribe to. Even though, you know, so I say, you know, very simply, I like the way Jesus lived. I want to live my life like him, right? And somebody else may very well say, I was sinking deep in sin. Jesus died for my sins. Now I'm saved, right? And, and so instead of arguing over the semantics of it, I say, whatever we can get to, uh, <coughs> whenever we can get to the point to where we understand our faith through our own experience, then we have served our faith well. What I think is needed and necessary is the deeper understanding that there's another choice out there. So again, back to the stove thing. So there is a, a stove that's hot that you bet not touch. But there's also a stove that may not be too hot to touch. They got food in there that you need. And I want us to know that we got choices. We, you, you know, and, and so as it relates to how we read scripture, it becomes important because, again, going back to what we said at the very beginning, how we read scripture is going to impact how we live and how we live is going to impact how we read scripture. Seeing Jesus the way Jesus is portrayed can be uh, can be intriguing and interesting even even when you don't have the other choices or, or when, even when you haven't been uh, compelled or conditioned or instructed on how to see Jesus as a multifaceted human being and not just the son of God but when you see Jesus as a multifaceted being and not just the son of God then the reading I think becomes more applicable as it relates to how I'm going to live like him so again scriptural references to Jesus' personhood and or his Christness are plentiful the term son of God first of all never occurs in the Old Testament so the Old Testament you never find son of God but it does occur in the gospel writings about 30 times and it appears about 60 times in the New Testament altogether. So this ain't, you know, this is bigger than just um, finding a translation other than the King James translation, right? This is being mindful of what is being communicated and how it's being communicated. Son of God never occurs in the Old Testament. 30 times in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? 30 times. And 60 times in the New Testament altogether. Son of man occurs over 80 times in the New Testament. And 75 of them 80 times are in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The majority of the time you find son of man in the New Testament, Jesus says this stuff himself out of his own mouth. He says something about the son of man. Son of man does occur in the Old Testament. At least according to the New International Version, but not to another contemporary translation. And when you see Son of Man in the Old Testament, it references uh, stuff like morality and just humanity. So like Job 25 and 6, Isaiah 51 and 12. It references a prophetic figure or people who are in the prophetic tradition, like in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it references political figures, like in Daniel chapter 7. It represents divine figures like in Psalms chapter 80 verse 17. So not only are the references of who Jesus is and how he is plentiful, they're also complex. This is what I'm trying to tell you. This is some complex stuff. So people do misread it. People do get lost in it, right? So people do go to sleep on it. I understand that. But I want us to look at this one particular passage for a little while and, and wrestle with some of the ways Jesus is being portrayed. These are exercises in interpretation. John chapter 1, starting with verse 43. Trey, let's find you a Bible back there, young homie. So again, keep this in mind now. What's the two primary references people give Jesus? Son of God and Son of Man. These are primary references when people talk about Jesus. Son of God, Son of Man. Which one usually speaks more to Jesus' divinity? Or being just like God? 
Son of God, right? Which one speaks more to Jesus being a human? Son of man, okay? Let's keep this in mind. John chapter 1, start at verse 43. So follow along in, in yours, uh, Travis, if you're in the Brown Bible, turn to page 1646 and 1647. Now remember, the first question I asked was, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow Jesus? We're going to see some people who follow Jesus in this text. And then we're going to see a conversation between Jesus and the people who are following him. Verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found the one who Moses in the law and all the prophets were writing about. What does Philip call Jesus? <laughs> Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. He doesn't call him son of God. He doesn't call him son of man. He doesn't call him the Messiah. He doesn't call him the Christ. He says... We found the one, now this may be a reference, let me rephrase it. This may, it may be a reference to him being the Messiah by saying, this is the one who Moses wrote about and all other prophets were writing about. But he calls him Jesus, son of Joseph. Not son of God, not son of man. You don't hear about that much, do you? This is the second time. We looked at a couple weeks ago uh, when Mary says, why have you embarrassed your father and I like this? And she's talking about Joseph, right? Mark is saying Joseph's parents. Here, here, this is John. This is the same John who was just arguing that Jesus, you know, early in the beginning of the, of the chapter, at the beginning of John's book, he's talking about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and Jesus became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. He's talking about a cosmic, eternal, spiritual Jesus, but now he's recording that one of the disciples who was following Jesus, back to the point earlier, Emmett, about doubt being okay, that you know, that you know, that you know, sounds good, but may not be our reality. He talking about Jesus not as the son of God, but as the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says to Philip in verse 46, you know, Nazareth, that nigga from Nazareth? <laughs> You know, can any good thing come out of it? For real? You, this the one? <laughs> him? He the one? Moses? I mean, you can hear it now, right? Like, what? Really? So it ain't a, it ain't a compelling, convincing. We know for a fact it's the one. Jesus is the, the son of God. He, you know, only begotten son, all this other stuff. That's not, that's not there yet. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, well, come see. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. He said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael, the same one who said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now says to Jesus, How you know me, God? <laughs> uh, where did you get to know me? And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael replies, this is the same Nathanael that said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Rabbi, you are the what? Okay, so already we got a reference to Jesus being the son of Joseph that comes from the mouth of Philip. Now we got a reference to Jesus being the son of God that comes out of the mouth of Nathanael. Notice this, Nathanael calls Jesus the son of God after a Philip tells him hey this is the one that the prophets were writing about this is the one that Moses was talking about in the law so that's one reference that's a theoretical reference 
Notice from just the theoretical reference, something that he heard somebody say, he is not convinced that Jesus is special at all. Did y'all hear that? You, you follow me, Sister Carter? He, he, ain't, he ain't impressed by what somebody else said and wrote about Jesus. When he hears about what somebody else said and wrote about Jesus, he says, who is that guy? That nigga from where? But after he speaks to Jesus and Jesus shows him something that I believe obviously in his mind is supernatural, then he says, Rabbi, which means teacher, you are the son of God. So notice this, it's a progression from just hearing about the whole way we've been taught belief and stuff like that. Just say, just confess with your mouth, believe it. Well, 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 wait a minute now. It takes some experience with you, some encounter with Jesus. And now Nathaniel says, you are the son of God. But notice he doesn't stop with that statement. He says, you are the son of God. What did he say right after that? Travis, what did he say after that? Verse 49, right after the Son of God, what'd you see? You are the King of Israel. Now, wait a minute. Don't you think it's interesting that the sentence doesn't stop at Son of God? Why do you think he says, you are the Son of God? You are the King of Israel, right after he said the Son of God. Because I thought Son of God is a reference strictly to what? Jesus being just like God, right? The Son of God, God's only begotten Son. The, you know, the God that, that, that nobody, you know, the, the type of child that God has that nobody else has. This is a divine endorsement. But right after that, right after that now, he says, King of Israel. Why do you think he put them two together? Okay, okay. Let, you know, it seems like you. Anybody else? Why? Why you think? Why you think he says? Right after he says, "Hey, you the son of God, you the king of Israel." But it seems like there's a relationship in his mind, right? There's a relationship between whoever the son of God is and whoever the king of Israel is. It could very well be, you know, this affirmation of Jesus being divine. And it could be that the divine son of God is supposed to be the king. Or it could be, you know, the son of God is just like the king of Israel. Where son of God takes on not only this divine thing, but also a political thing. You know, king is a political term. King is a ruler of the people. Sometimes elected... <laughs> Sometimes, you know, uh, yeah, appointed, sometimes just takes the kingship by force. You know, uh, if you ever play chess, you kill the king, what happened? And who win? The person who killed the king, right? And who in control? The person who killed the king, okay? So, look, and, and let me make it to this last part, then we'll just talk this out, or at least try to talk this out. And I'll tell you why I wanted to raise this. Jesus responds to him by saying, oh yeah, you just not figured out I'm the son of God? Yeah, you know, I, I was, uh, 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 in the beginning was the word and, and the word was me and the word was with me. He don't say none of that stuff. He said, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater stuff than this. And he said to him, very truly I tell you you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon who? Son of man. Who did Jesus just refer to himself as? Son of man. Okay, so notice here very complex some references to Jesus. I'm, I'm saying all this to say again, you we have options 
when it comes to how we identify. Nathaniel has some options. Philip has some options. Philip says, hey, that's Joseph's son. Now notice, don't ever forget this. Jesus tells Philip to follow him, and Philip follows him. Then when they ask him who it is he's following, that's Joseph's boy. It's a real homeboy type thing here, right? That's your, I mean, I know his people. That's Joseph's son, right? But he still thinks enough of him to associate Joseph's son, common, everyday, regular carpenter, Joseph, his son. He says, this is the one who Moses and the law and the prophets were writing about. He doesn't just make him a supernatural deity. That's Philip. He talks to Nathaniel about it. Nathaniel, who is this nigga? He from Nazareth? Come on, man. He from Nazareth. For real? You want me to roll with somebody from Nazareth? You know, folk over in that part of town don't get along with the people over in our part of town. I mean, this is kind of sort of what he's saying indirectly. And then Jesus sees Nathaniel coming to him. He say, oh, man, you are an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel said, man, how do you know me? <laughs> well, I saw you under the fig tree even before Philip called you. And then Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you, you the son of God. You, you, the king, you the king. Options, options. You see this king of Israel, option. Son of God, option. The one who Moses and the prophets wrote about, option. Son of Joseph, option. Jesus says, do you believe because I told you that I saw you <clears throat> under the fig tree? If so, you ain't seen nothing yet. I got more in store. You're going to see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. But he did not say son of God. He didn't even say me. You're going to see him descending on the son of man. So if the sacred scriptures reflection of who Jesus is is indeed diverse, it's plentiful, and it's complex, then why has the son of God identifier become so prominent? It, this one verse, this, this one verse, this, this is... I mean, this, this, this one excerpt, this is eight verses. And in eight verses, we got the one whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, that's one. Son of Joseph, that's two. Rabbi, that's three. Son of God, that's four. King of Israel, that's five. Son of man, that's six. Six references to him, six different references. In eight verse. So how did we get from all of this to oh no, that's just the Son of God, the God's only begotten Son? Well, let me tell you what I think. I think it's a byproduct of an attempt to present Jesus in a white form. It's an attempt by dominant white forces, social, political, and religious to mystify, hyper-mystify, deify Jesus so that the people who follow him would do so out of a desire for spiritual salvation and not as a model of practical liberation and political transformation. We want, somebody wants us to stay away from the stove that got the food in it. Because the stove that got the food in it means Jesus inspires us to be about practical liberation and political transformation, doing something about the world we live in and how we see ourselves in relationship with the world we live in. Somebody just want us to know that stove is hot. And don't you go over there and be touching it. Jesus will save you from that stove. And I do believe there are some stoves that Jesus saves us from. And I also think that there are some stoves that Jesus calls us to, calling us to challenge prevailing assumptions about how hot some stoves are. Because certain people feel like they got access and privileges to the food in that stove and they don't want people like us to be inspired to go check that stove out <coughs> and get some of the food in there that belongs to us as much as it belongs to anybody else. Because not only, I know we've been talking about this chosen people thing, well, if Jesus is a son of God, if God has sons and daughters, don't all of a parent's children have rights and privileges to the same stuff. 
then that means all of us are God's chosen. Any questions or, or comments? Travis, what you what you done heard us talk about, young brother? Everything. Well, I mean, what does any of this make sense to you? And if it does, tell me what makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me a question and see if I can try to clarify some of it. But yeah, I know what. That's all right. Yeah. Tell us something we don't know. Yeah, I came late. <coughs> try to try to say it however you okay. I want to try to find some words for you <coughs> and tell me about it. Here's what I think you could you could say. If somebody's asking you, what was Pastor Earl talking about tonight? I think you say, people make choices on how they understand who Jesus is. Because people have options. There's people who say Jesus is Son of God, the only Son of God, Jesus is God. And then there's people who believe that, but also believe Jesus, when he was on earth, was human. And so Pastor Earl is trying to get us to understand this human side of Jesus. Because some people try to hide the human side. They're afraid that us knowing about Jesus' human side may lead us to act and live just like he did. And there's certain people that don't want that. So again, people are making these choices. No, and if anybody else got a question, you know, people are making these choices. This, this is what I'm trying to lift up. People are making choices on who they identify with or how they identify with Jesus. And it is convenient for some to say, when you think about Jesus, all you need to think about is he saved your soul from sin. It's bigger than that. When somebody asks you what it means to be a Christian, we ain't just saying Jesus saved our soul from sin. We saying to be a Christian means to try to live a life like Jesus lived. To be in a relationship with God like Jesus was in a relationship with God. To have that type of commitment, to have that type of conviction, to have that type of compassion, to have that type of courage. So this is what it means we want to live like Jesus, be like Jesus. Tell me what y'all think. Give me your feedback, your comments. Then we'll wrap this up. Questions, comments, feedback. Everyday life, uh, black people don't want to get involved. Don't want to uh, take a stand. I looked at a black attorney, and she was talking about she was a black law professor. She was talking about the number of black youth being incarcerated for uh, the sale and use of marijuana. Mm -hmm. But every day on the news, you see white men selling marijuana. They're doing the same thing that the black youth are doing. Mm -hmm. But they're selling it. They're paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Can that supposed to make it right. They ain't going to jail. They ain't feeling that pain of having their rights taken away. And their families broken up and their careers being yeah, damaged yeah. because after you get out then you can't nobody hire you because you got right. a felony or, or you got the stigma. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, and, yeah. I that, and I sat there and I said well you're a professor what are you doing about it? Mm. You, you know the law. What are you doing about it? And some of us that have that access, that have that that opportunity, that portal, refuse. They want to throw stones.
stone in their eye. And it's like, but you know, when you look at the young black man, well, this one youngster was saying that it's not right about the, him being incarcerated. The only thing he ever did wrong was to sell the marijuana. And he felt like it was wrong, but he knew it was wrong in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have any other options. Yeah. Because he was going to school, he wasn't studying. He was going to school, he was disrespected. And at some point, all these things catch up with you. Now, what are you going to do? You got a baby. You need a job. Mama don't want you because you're causing too many problems for her. So now what you going to do? Only option. Do something illegal. That's illegal in Georgia, but not illegal in Colorado. In Colorado, <laughs> Utah. Oh, yeah, or Washington, right? Yeah. Yeah, but they make it, you know, real money. So uh, it seemed to me like some of these young black men need to think about relocating. <laughs> Or, you know, and I think you're raising some real critical questions to the professor. So what you going to do about it, right? And that's ultimately the, the question that I try to get us to wrestle with every week when we're dealing with this. You know, based upon who Jesus is to you, what you going to do about some of this stuff, right? Uh, I, was, I was yesterday, I don't know if y'all know this, but when the city council elected to cut the pension and some of the benefits of our firefighters and police officers, People put a rally together, right? It's a pro protest rally. Um, down at City Hall, yesterday, you know, they had the city council meetings on Tuesday. So we're going to start at 10 and uh, supposed to end somewhere, I guess, around 3 or people going to the meeting and all this other stuff. Well, I went down there, of course, because uh, part of what my faith calls me to do is to stand up for people who are being treated unfairly, right? Even if it ain't me. Now, I'm thinking to myself, with all of the black firefighters, all of the black police officers in this city, and all of the people who are in all of these black churches, right? You, you would think that black folks, the people of faith, going to be people down there in droves, packed out, right? What well, they made to be, no, wait, black folks, it, man, it was a handful of black folks down there. Now, granted, I went there the whole time, so I don't know who was there before me. I don't know who was there after me, but I was there prime time, around lunchtime, which means even when, if you were a working person, if you're serious about this thing, then you go down there during your lunch hour, and then you come back to work, right? But you at least show yourself, you at least do something. We went down there, you know how many pastors was down there? Two that I seen. Two. I was one of them. I even talked to the other pastor. Like, well, you know, hey, hey, hey. You say, I mean, that's that. Just me and you look like. And so the question I keep wrestling with is, what are we doing with this faith that we keep talking about? We, you know, what does it mean to be Christian? We said it got something to do with a lifestyle. We, we say it got something to do with discipline. You can't just go where you want to go. can't just say what you want to say, all this other stuff. You, you got to live for something. You got to fight for something. You got to stand for something. That's what you said. Black, black, you, you said black folks won't stand for nothing. And I think, by and large, there's a, there's a strong constituency of black people who fit that description. We don't want to do nothing except for whine and complain. Now, I know most black folks either know a black police officer or firefighter or got them in their family. Or at the very least, no. The same thing happened to them can happen to some of us. Absolutely. And you would think that they would stand for something. But our faith, the way it's been presented to us for a real long time, hear me, Travis, the way the faith has been presented to us for a real long time, oftentimes doesn't require us to do nothing. Notice when I ask, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Nobody said, you come to church, you read your Bible, you pray every day, you give your tithes and all, which is part of our discipline. It is. It's part of our discipline. But most of all, it's about living a life that reflects, this is what it means to be a congregation that actively lives out our faith, the stuff I've been talking about for the past few weeks in the mission statement. This, this is what it means to live your faith out loud. It means get up and do something in the name of Jesus, other than just coming to church, other than just singing a song. And, you know, by, by God, do Listen, your pastor wants you in worship every week. I want I want y'all in worship every week. Every week. Barring any employment emergency or uh, barring any medical emergency, 
or barring the fact that you've been in church so many times so often that you just need a break once a, you know, once every three months or something like that, right? Your, your pastor wants you in worship. Let me tell you why though. It ain't just to count the number of people in the sanctuary. It ain't just to get everybody to tithe, although we need that, we need the money, y'all look at the roof, we need it, right? It is because I believe this is the place where you get your information and your inspiration to go out and live your faith on an everyday basis. And if you don't want, if we don't have this uh, consistent pattern of worship attendance, then where are we go we gonna keep misre we gonna keep misreading this stuff, keep misinterpreting this stuff, or keep just tilting towards don't worry about it, Jesus is gonna fix it all. So I'm going to end on that note tonight, and then we're going to come back next week and look at some more of this stuff. But it is my prayer that we uh, develop a faith that we live out in public day to day.